This program is funded by the following. Norwegian salmon is ocean farmed by craftsmen blending tradition with technology. historical island of Big Day. I'm Andreas Wiestad. Today's program is about new food and traditional food. It's about what we eat when we're on the run and what we eat to celebrate our children's birthday and national day. And this food is one and the same. It's sausages or hot dogs. And in today's program, I'll analyze this wonderful dish in its different components, or to put it more simply, I'm gonna make it myself from scratch. And I'll start off with lumpe, the Norwegian potato pancake that normally accompanies sausages. Then I'm going to see what I can do to improve upon two of the world's most popular condiments, ketchup and mustard. And then finally, the sausages themselves. Sausage making is a craft, but once you master it, your options are limitless. I'm gonna make three different versions. One with pork, with lamb and veal, and three wildly different temperaments. start off with the lumpe, the Norwegian potato pancake that almost always accompanies sausages and hot dogs. And the lumpe is something quite different from your normal sausage roll, because no matter how good a sausage roll is, it is really nothing more than just plain white bread. A lumpe is different. It has the taste of the land and of tradition. To make your own lumpe, you need boiled potatoes. Here I've got a, about a kilo, a little more than two pounds of potatoes that I've boiled and then peeled. And then you're gonna mash them. You can either use a hand masher or a meat grinder, but you must not use a food processor because that will just leave a gluey texture. To the potatoes I add a bit of all-purpose flour. Uh, this is about half a pound, a little more than 200 grams. But I don't add it all at once. I leave a little for when I'm gonna roll out the potato pancakes. And then salt, normal table salt, about a tablespoon. A hint of nutmeg. Not too much though, because it's rather overpowering if you use too much. And then just mix this together. And then run it through the meat grinder one more time. Towards the end, it's smart to press down using a rubber spatula. Because I care about my spatula, it's a fine thing. 
but I care much more about my fingers. The dough should be loose, as loose as possible without falling apart. And that's a balance that you've got to work on finding. So the first couple of lumpa that you make will not turn out perfect, I'm afraid. I'm cooking the lumpa over relatively high heat. You can use any kind of equipment, basically. You can use a non-stick uh, frying pan, but just don't use any fat at all. And what you're looking for is freckles, like these. recipes at our website, newscancook.com. the Norwegian Museum of Cultural History on Big Day just outside of Oslo. Walking here is walking through history. It's also walking through every part of Norway. Each little cluster of houses represents one region or one county. Here I'm in Telemark in southeastern Norway. This house is from the early 18th century complete with farm girl. Hello! Hi. And this building here dates back to the early 19th century and was a guest house on a farm. And this amazing building here dates all the way back to the early 14th century. It used to be a storehouse or a loft. They're not just farm buildings here, parts of historical Oslo, buildings that had to give way for new developments have been moved here and constitute an old town out here on the island. Most Norwegian sausages are something special. It's not just hot dogs. It has a sort of double position. Sausages are something you eat when you're on the run. But when we celebrate, we eat sausages too. On Constitution Day, we celebrate ourselves, our nation and our constitution by eating sausages. Even our queen has been seen eating sausages as well. This picture is from the turn of the century. So that means that our Queen Sonia entered this new millennium with a taste of sausages in her mouth. Runa Döving is professor of marketing and a sausage researcher. How come sausages have entered this double space that they're both a sort of um, food on the run and food you eat to celebrate? It's because we in Norway we distinguish very strongly between everyday food and we have special rules for what we eat for dinner. We eat an inside with a knife and a fork and the meat should be prepared by the parents and in the kitchen. But uh, the sausage is the opposite. You eat it with your fingers, it's produced by some factory and the, the kitchen is outside. So, so uh, this is the opposite of everyday meal. But it's more than just junk food, isn't it? It's more than junk food. Be because, I mean, junk food, you, you have specific types yeah. of junk food that only, you know, kids will eat yeah. or something, but our queen eats it and right. our taxi drivers eat it right. and our kids eat it. It's a reward for, for, uh, for what you have uh, done in, in the week. Mm -hmm. you, you get the reward in the form of e eating what you should not eat in every day. And therefore it's the perfect food for the children. And since uh, our Constitution Day is a, is a children's day, we give it for children. In Norway, we're pretty rule-bound. Mm. It's a sausage, a symbol of uh, 
where, where Norwegians are suddenly allowed to break a rule. Yeah, it is. And during the night we break the rules. Why eating? Why, why eating this this junk? Mm -hmm. And uh, for the Constitution Day is actually a celebration, but it's also a celebration in forms that you don't know what's inside the, the sausage. So you have to trust some somebody, some, something, and in a way it symbolizes that you trust the whole society. Do you trust me? I trust you. I'll make some sausages afterwards. Thank you can you. have a taste. <laughs> Lumpe is a very Norwegian thing, but the typical condiments that go with sausages here in Norway, they're pretty universal. That's ketchup and mustard. And I think we all have the same relationship to ketchup and mustard. We know what it is. It is what the food industry has defined for us. It's what's in the jar and in the bottle. But it doesn't really have to be that way. You can actually make your own ketchup and make your own mustard and define for yourself what it should taste like. I'm gonna start off by making mustard. And here you have mustard seed. And when they're dry like this, they're very hard to work with because they're incredibly hard and bouncy and you know they'll jump wherever you don't want them to jump. But here I soaked them overnight in white wine uh, vinegar and they're quite strong mustard taste and a little bit sour, quite pleasantly so. The mustard that I'm going to make today is going to be quite strong but also quite sweet. So I'm gonna add some honey. This is Norwegian summer honey. And then I'm gonna add a few coriander seeds. And coriander has this warm, earthy flavor that I think goes very well with the, you know, the cold sting of the mustard. And both mustard and coriander are really old plants in Norway and have been part of uh, medicinal traditions and also of cooking for centuries. Now, it's got the really nice balance between mustard and coriander. But because of the honey, it's rather on the sweet side. So I want to make it stronger. I've got some mustard powder here, and I add about you know, a half a teaspoon. This is really, really, you know, it isn't hot stuff, but it's strong stuff. Just a little bit on now. Oh, yeah. So don't use too much. Now this mustard is really, really thick. So I'm gonna add vinegar. This is white wine vinegar. You can also use apple cider vinegar, which will give you a sort of fruity note as well. Mm. Now this is how I like my mustard. It's got some punch and quite a lot of acidity and then kind of rounded off by the sweetness of honey. As for the other condiment that goes with sausages, ketchup, we've all got an idea exactly what ketchup should be. And it's what's in that bottle. It was invented by a food producing company in 1876. And we still kind of measure every ketchup by it. I'm gonna make a version of ketchup that is unusual. It's not about cooking the tomatoes for a very, very long time. It's actually about grilling them. By grilling the tomatoes or actually baking them on a grill, you get a completely different flavor than if you just cook the tomatoes for a long, long time. Because some of the tomatoes will be a little bit charred and you'll have some of the smoky taste from the charcoal underneath. And that brings a new dimension into the ketchup. I've baked the tomatoes with some onion, some garlic, one bay leaf, and I sprinkled it all with a little bit of brown sugar to help increase the caramelization. Ketchup is basically a spiced tomato sauce. 
I always like to use a bit of cinnamon. I think it's about yay much <laughs> a finger's worth. And then cloves. Two cloves. Coriander seeds. And then it's normal to use cumin, but I use its close relative caraway, which has a much more Scandinavian taste. Mm. It's got a kind of rough smokiness to it that I really haven't tasted in any commercial ketchups. It's also got a freshness to it. It doesn't really feel like tomato jam, which regular ketchup does. And to accentuate the freshness, I'm gonna add just a couple of fresh tomatoes. And then it needs brown sugar, a little bit of honey, scant teaspoon, and a splash of vinegar. This is how I like my ketchup with this smoky flavor and not as sweet as commercial ketchup at all, but it tastes much more of tomatoes than a regular ketchup. Just tomatoes with an attitude. When I grew up, not that long ago, there were half a dozen butchers close by our house and my grandmother would buy one kind of sausages from one place and another type of sausages from another. They all had their specialities. Today, sausage making is highly industrialized and perhaps it has to be in order to produce the right volumes. But this can make us forget what the sausages are made of, where they come from. Sausages don't come from the hot dog stand, not even from the sausage maker or butcher. They come from the farm and it's all centered around the pig. Pig is such a wonderful animal. Think of all the good things we get from it. We get the ham, we get the shoulder or Boston butt and bacon and pancetta and pork chops. But once you've accounted for all these known parts, you're left with a whole lot of meat. It may not have a name that we know, but it often tastes better than the other more well-known cuts. And this meat is what goes into sausages. And this can explain how sausages have been able to get this position as being both a food of necessity and a luxury. making it seems is an almost forgotten craft at least when it comes to home production but I'm doing my best to keep tradition alive and today I'm going to make three very different sausages with very different temperaments the thing to remember when you're making sausages is find your percentage of fat and of salt and stick to it uh, I've decided that all sausages that I'm making should contain about 20% fat much more than that and they will be too greasy and much less they will have a tendency to become dry and I've also decided that they should contain about 1.5 percent salt. The first sausage I'm gonna make today must have been something very rare, very exclusive. It consists not only of pork 
but also of veal in addition to lard in order to adjust the fat level. When you're making your own sausages, you should always try to grind your own meat. That way you know that the meat is freshly minced. Here I've got the three components. I've got the veal, the pork and the lard. A total of a little more than two pounds, one kilo. And then I mix the three. I add the salt, one tablespoon, 15 grams. And then I'm gonna flavor it with fennel, which has this warm, aromatic flavor. And then fennel's Scandinavian cousin, dill. Then some garlic, a couple of cloves. Then I put it into the sausage maker. This is a kind of almost professional grade sausage maker, but many normal kitchen machines come with an extension. So if you've got a mincer on your kitchen machine, then you can probably buy another extension to make sausages as well. casings for these first big generous veal and pork sausages. The next sausages that I'm going to make are lamb sausages and again with lamb you've got quite a lot of cutoffs that you don't necessarily uh, use. These parts that are from the breast and all over they are pretty tasty. So here I've got minced lamb and then a little more fat on the side. And typically with lamb sausages, we go for herbs, either very aromatic herbs or bitter herbs. And not necessarily rosemary because that doesn't grow much in Norway, but thyme does and oregano does and not least lovage. I don't know if you know lovage. It's not much used anymore, but I think it's really nice. It's very, very powerful. It's quite bitter, so use it in moderation. And for the lamb sausages, I've used lamb casings, so you get distinctly thinner sausages. The last sausage I'm going to make today is something that I picked up in the United States. Uh, I was traveling on book tour and I came to Seattle, to Ballard, and uh, everyone said to me, well, you're from Norway, don't you ever get tired of potato pulsa? And that means potato sausage. And to be honest, I'd never even heard about it, but everyone there associated Scandinavia with potato sausage. And when I came back, I investigated a bit and I found out that potato sausage was rather common in the late 19th century. And immigrants had come from Norway to Seattle and the tradition had been frozen in time. It is a dish that is testament to how scarce life could be on farms in Norway because in its most bare and basic version it consists only of potatoes and lard, no meat at all. And then if you were a little more affluent you could add a little bit of meat or quite a lot of meat. The version I'm going to make today will consist of equal parts potato and meat plus lard and another ingredient that uh, was frequently used as a shortening in uh, sausages, namely barley. And then salt, about a tablespoon to a kilo, or a little more than two pounds. And then a splash of milk as well. Remember that you can find all the recipes at our website, newscancook.com. Now it's time to set up shop.
For more of the New Scandinavian Cooking Experience, visit our website or Facebook page. This program is funded by the following. Norwegian salmon is ocean farmed by craftsmen blending tradition with technology.